I had an overwhelming response today from a post that I did on Instagram asking you what topics you want me to do and more specifically topics that I had already put uh, forward. So ever since uh, starting this YouTube channel, I have just had ideas coming out of my brain. And honestly, these are, these are ideas that I've wanted to do videos, videos on for so long, but I just haven't quite had the platform to do it or there would be perfectionism in the way. And so now all of a sudden though, this creativity is just flowing and I feel like this is it. Like lately I've been going to bed so excited that I can't even sleep because I'm just like, I, I just feel like something amazing is happening here. I'm just finally in that space that I wanted to be and bring you guys the content that I know that you want and I feel is not quite out there enough for you guys. So in response to the post that I did today on the topics, there've been a few that have come up more than once. And however, I'm going to go in order of response. So whoever responded first, I'm going to respond. So the first topic that we're actually going to do today is on my battle with SIBO. So some of you may know what SIBO is, some of you may not. It is much more of a newer condition that's coming to light. Practitioners such as naturopaths and nutritionists have known of it for probably a lot longer than other people uh, because we're often very progressive with gut health and would often be treating things long before uh, doctors would be getting onto it or even we would be hypothesizing what would be going on because we have such a holistic perspective on how the body works before the research would even catch up. So one of those is definitely gut health and naturopaths, naturopaths have been going on about gut health long before uh, doctors were adopting it. And, you know, I used to hear my lecturers saying, honestly, they, they would get laughed at when they would recommend that something was going on in the gut. So it's a pretty good feeling when you know that you're in a profession that was onto something a long time ago. So more specifically, SIBO. So it's called, it stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And it's where the bacteria that should really be residing in only the large intestine is making its way up to the small intestine and wreaking havoc there. And then when the bacteria in the small intestine, it ferments certain sugars in our foods and then causes that bloating and discomfort. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is that SIBO is the highest reason for IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome. They say around 90% of cases of IBS is due to SIBO. Now, the other thing though is you may have SIBO and not have the typical IBS symptoms. However, most people do notice that there's something off with their gut. And firstly, it can be that you're just someone who always gets bloated, you can't put your finger on it, you know that you do better on a low FODMAP diet, but then a low FODMAP diet isn't permanent. You really shouldn't be doing that for you know years and years because that means that you haven't addressed the issue. So when it comes to myself, I have a very real experience with SIBO because I have had it myself. So last year, a rep from GastroLab came to my clinic when I was practicing in at Tidal Flow Yoga in Oakley in Melbourne and wanted to show me uh, their technology that they use for SIBO testing. And I was already aware of, you know, as practitioners, we have access to so many different functional paths labs and stuff like that but I hadn't used GastroLab before and I thought yeah cool I'll give it a go and I actually said to the rep I said honestly I would like to do it myself I've always wanted to know whether I have it because I've had gut issues for years and years and years I think the first recollection I have of having a gut issue was when I was 13 in Bali with my mum and it started off with a little bit of barley belly I got the typical diarrhea traveler's diarrhea and then I don't think I was quite right after that. Then when I was 15, luckily, so lucky, I was overseas with my family on a round the world trip and we were in England and I got appendicitis while I was there. So I had to have my appendix taken out. Now back then it was believed that the appendix isn't important, it doesn't serve a purpose and I'll be fine. Sure. 
you can still live a very healthy life. However, what I have later learned and what the research is now showing is that the appendix could actually play a crucial role into your gut health. I'm actually going to talk a, a little bit more about that in another single video on why the appendix is so important. Um, so I won't dive into that today. However, understanding what I know now, I definitely realized that that could be another reason why I was later on down the line led to have all these gut issues and intolerances and ultimately SIBO. So as I was saying um, last year, I did the test for myself. The, the reps from Gastro Lab uh, very generously gave me a whole kit so that I could do it myself and experience it too because it's quite a, a, uh, a tedious test to do. And um, yes, tedious it was because you, you've really got to allocate quite a few hours each morning to take each. So you've got um, glucose and lactulose, these little syrups you have to take. And then you do a breath test every uh, half an hour, I think. Is it half an hour, hour? And so anyway, I sure enough came back. Not only did I have SIBO, I also had fructose malabsorption very high fr fructose malabsorption so there's different grades and mine was severe and then i also had the worst of two evils with SIBO so you've got typically there's hydrogen and methane a lot of people just have the hydrogen type i'll talk about what this means in a minute um or there's the methane type, which is more of a bitch to get rid of. And guess what? I had high methane. So I was like, ah, that definitely, definitely explains why I've had so many problems with my gut. I've taken every supplement under the sun. I've tried to do all the, the gut healing protocols, the probiotics, the prebiotics, you know, cleaning up the diet, lemon water in the morning, you know, everything that anyone could have told me and nothing was really working. So once I figured out that I had SIBO, I was like, okay, that's good because now I know what I'm doing and what I'm working with. So the next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about, as I was saying, is the hydrogen and methane dominance. Just one moment, I'm going to turn the light on because it is actually starting to get quite dark in here and I'm worried you might not be able to see me. Sorry guys, I know this lighting is a little bit shit. I cannot stand artificial light in videos. However, it's just what we're working with when I do a video late at, in the day. So as I was talking about, methane and hydrogen are really important to differentiate between because we treat them differently. So hydrogen dominant or just hydrogen SIBO is typically associated with IBS diarrhea. So that's where you have the irritable bowel, particularly in the morning, and it leads to a complete evacuation of the bowels. Um, so that's that looser, looser stools. So the IBSD is what we call the IBS diarrhea. Whereas the methane dominant is a whole nother kettle of fish. It is typically associated with constipation. So there's these um, methanogen bacteria that produce methane gases and they significantly can contribute to really slow transit time. I've had patients who've said that they will have one bowel movement a week, maybe even longer. And trust me, it is so awesome when they come in and say that they're finally having good bowel movements because not only does it re reduce discomfort, but it's also really important to have daily bowel movements because you are eliminating toxins. And what happens with those toxins is if you're constipated, they get reabsorbed back into the body, um, particularly with estrogen too. So estrogen can get reabsorbed and then you just keep causing this estrogen dominant picture. So as I was saying, I had the methane dominant SIBO and I knew because I have been prone to slower transit time. Luckily, because of what I know, being a naturopath, I had been doing a lot of dietary things without even knowing that I had SIBO that were slightly alleviating my bowel movements more than what they had in the past though. However, I did always think to myself, surely they've got to be better than this. And so that answered it. So then what do you do to get rid of SIBO? So. SIBO, like I said, is a bitch to get rid of because there are so many contributing factors as to why you might have it. So one of, well, first of all, we've got to start from the very root cause. For example, you may have not 
um, you may have had your appendix removed. There may be some inflammation around the ileocecal valve, which is the connection between the small and the large intestine. And that's, that shouldn't be allowing um, a back flush of bacteria, whereas in SIBO, obviously something allowed that to happen. There may be some sort of structural misalignment that has allowed that to happen. And that's actually the reason why some osteos and chiros are now specializing in SIBO because they can actually manipulate that area. Um, there may be scar tissue and adhesions around that area that could have been caused by surgery. And also such as having a, an appendectomy can just be enough for having for having some scar tissue there. I'm almost certain that I've got adhesions because I always, ever since I had appendicitis, um, I've got a, like a, it feels like something's kind of stuck there and I sometimes get this pulling pain around there and it's not my ovaries because my ovaries are, are a little bit lower. And so, yeah, that's the first thing you've got to identify. So sometimes it can be something structural that can be fixed, whereas sometimes it could be something that's permanent, such as not having your appendix. So once again, I'm gonna talk about that in another video to come. Um, but the next thing that we have to do is a pretty solid, what some people would term a, a weed seed and feed. We don't really like to call it that anymore because it doesn't quite mean what it sounds like. However, it, it's still a good, just an easy term to explain what I'm saying. So what that means, so weed, you've got to basically weed out that overgrown bacteria. You've got to seed, which means put back the bacteria back in um, and then feed. So feed those bacteria so that they can flourish. I won't explain why that's not completely true. The weed seed and feed um, term isn't true anymore today. I'll explain it in another video. Uh, however, so that kind of explains it in a nutshell. But with SIBO, it's not enough to just go in there with some antimicrobial herbs and get rid of it. So there's kind of two ways. Actually, no, there's three main ways that you can get rid of SIBO. One is antibiotics. <clears throat> Even though I'm fairly against antibiotics, unless it's life-threatening, 100% hands down, we need antibiotics to save certain, save ourselves from certain conditions without question. However, antibiotics today, and we know this, they're just being thrown around left, right and center, and then therefore we're getting antibiotic resistance. People are getting sicker. It's wiping out your good gut bugs, causing all these problems. We're seeing in the research now that antibiotics are related to so many conditions. That's another topic for another video. However, in SIBO, I have seen it where some people have to have antibiotics. Like, it's just so bad that they need that clean slate. However, the second one is almost the herbal equivalent of antibiotics, which are antimicrobial herbs. And research actually shows that antimicrobial herbs, even though they take slightly longer to get rid of the SIBO, it's actually better in terms of longevity and is less likely to come back. And of course, you're also, it's not as hardcore as some antibiotics where they just wipe out everything. Whereas some herbs can actually be a little bit, a little bit more selective and still kind of leave your good gut bugs alone. So that's the second way to get rid of SIBO. But then third way is actually through the um, elemental diet. So elemental diet is pretty hardcore. I haven't done it, but I tell you what, there was one point when I was considering doing it. So it's a formula that's, so the reason why it's called elemental, because it just contains all the elements that you need in a diet without real foods. So it's kind of like a shake almost. And apparently it tastes awful and you've got to take it for, I think it's 10 days, uh, depending on how severe it is. And what that does is just completely starves out this bacteria so they've got nothing to feed on. However, it still feeds you, your body, so that you're getting all the nutrients that you need. I know that a lot of people say that a nice little extra bonus is that you might lose some weight from it as well. But I would not suggest doing it if you've got a hardcore job or exercising or anything like that. I would actually suggest taking some time off if you're going to do that because you might be a little bit fatigued and like maybe a little bit hard in the, um, to begin with. So there are three ways. So the first, the way that I've um, healed my SIBO is of course herbal medicines. And I've, have, I've had to do this twice. So the first time was not successful. So I did it the first time last year um, after I found out I had SIBO and I did exactly the protocol that I would give my patients as well. 
and but I really did pick a bad time to do it. I did it around, um, I think it was like October, November, so just before Christmas time. This is the worst time to do a SIBO protocol when you're surrounded by food and you know Christmas parties and people that love food. And of course myself, I'm often the one cooking food and bringing to these things. And so with a SIBO um, diet, it's very specific. So you may have heard of um, what's called the biphasic protocol. So that's where you have to eat certain amount of foods in, in, for this amount of weeks, and then you um, bring in these foods for this amount of weeks. And so it's, it's very specific. It's very similar to like a FODMAP diet. In fact, that's pretty much, uh, it's like a FODMAP diet, but th there's a bit more structure to what you're doing and when you're bringing it in. And so I started doing that and I was feeling really good. Like I, I noticed finally that I was waking up and not having pain, whereas I used to honestly wake up with pain in my gut every morning. I'd always be bloated, all those kind of things. Plus when your gut's out, you get a lot of other issues. So it can, can be linked with your hormones, your skin health, your energy, your moods, period pain, inflammation, headaches. Like it can just cause just about everything. And so I definitely was feeling a lot better. And then I noticed my food intolerances were a lot better once I started reintroducing foods. However, I did not quite complete the SIBO protocol because I very quickly rebounded when it was Christmas and I just ate everything under the sun that was no good. So that led me to the next problem is that not only had I not finished it properly, I had now rebounded, I had, now gotten all those symptoms back, but even worse, because it's very important at the end of the protocol that you finish it correctly. Otherwise, the um, some of the bacteria that are still hanging around, they like you know antibiotic resistance, they become resistant and then they come back even worse. So I, that's kind of where I was. And to be honest, um, at the start of this year, I had some um, pretty full on health issues myself and it honestly, I believe, ended up being linked to my gut going out of whack again. So I was like, all right, I need to do this properly next time. So I, I did this. I got all the supplements again. I got everything I needed. I was starting to follow the plan properly. And this time I made it stick. And so now I'm able to eat like a little bit of onion and garlic again, which is like a big one for a lot of people. I can't have too much onion, I notice. It will make me quite bloated if I have too much, but I can have a little bit. Um, and then I can also have certain fruits again in small doses. The thing is though, so I do have fructose malabsorption and something that I actually learned only recently is that uh, fructose malabsorption for the most part is genetic. And so even though it can definitely reduce the severity by healing things such as SIBO and, and just generally healing the gut, uh, fructose malabsorption may never 100% resolve if, you, if it's genetic. And so to be honest, when I look at my family and their gut history issues, I have no doubt that they are fructose malabsorbers as well. Apparently it's actually um, in that the European uh, popular in the, I think it was like, I can't remember exactly where in Europe, but I remember it relating to my heritage, which is English. So I'll have to look that up. Anyway, so fructose malabsorption is always going to be something that I've got to be careful with. So um, fructose is typically high in, it's high in all your, your lollies and sugary foods and fruit juices. So a lot of your processed stuff that I don't eat anyway, but it is also high in fruits. So, and certain other vegetables as well. So I do just have to be careful of that and that's okay. But for the most part now, my gut is so much better. I have regular bowel movements. In fact, lately I've been having around two bowel movements a day and they're complete and solid. And for those of you who don't like to talk about poos, well, get used to it because I talk about poo all the time because it is so important. And before I was honestly struggling to have one daily bowel movement. And even if I did, I would be literally straining to the point where I did actually have bleeding sometimes. 
And I'm sure some of you, if you have SIBO yourself, you will relate with this. And I am going to do a video more that's diving into constipation a little bit more. So, a but the thing is though with SIBO is it's very highly likely to relapse. And the reason is because there are those root causes that I talked about um, that may not be addressed. So some of those root causes may be fixable, some may more need permanent maintenance. So for example, with myself, with my appendix issue. So um, you've got to figure out what that is and then kind of tailor it to what's going on in your body. But I often get people tell me, and I'm also in a lot of SIBO forums on Facebook and stuff like that, where there's people from all over the world that have SIBO and are struggling with it and they've tried to treat it like several times and it keeps coming back. Um, so look, like I said, everyone's individual, but there are a few different reasons that I'm gonna explain here that could be the reason why it's coming back or you're not 100% resolving it. So the first one is, so whichever whichever poison you, you choose to wipe it out, is it specific to the, the the dominance? So is it specific to just hydrogen or is if you've got methane dominant, are you taking the herbs that are specific to methane? Because I can tell you right now, it does make a difference. Secondly, as well, is actually something called biofilms. So biofilms are basically this coating that bacteria build over themselves. I love to think of, you know, those sci-fi movies that where they would have that like invisible dome over their cities to pre like protect themselves. That's how I kind of envision what these bacteria do. So they build this protective shield so that that's how they become resistant. So they cannot be penetrated by herbs and antibiotics and other things. So you need to have a biofilm disruptor in your protocol. Like it is just non-negotiable. There's heaps of different biofilm disruptors, um, but they're, they're quite specific. And so, and you've got to take them at certain times of the day to make sure that it's effective. Also, um, it's, you know, it's also about timing. So you need to make sure that you're doing it for long enough. But then once you've finished the protocol, how you reintroduce foods again and how you heal your gut is super crucial as well. So once you reintroduce the foods that you've eliminated, you need to do it very carefully and specifically. If you go out and just all of a sudden indulge in pizza or ice cream or something that's high in those FODMAPI foods, you could have it all coming, come flooding back. Or you can get away with maybe once here or there, which I noticed with myself, like I can have a whole carby meal one day and I'm like, sweet, I feel fine, I must be healed. But then if I'm like, oh sweet, I'll have another meal the next day because I know I'm fine, that's when it starts to creep back in again. So you do have to be super careful. So that would be the main things with SIBO when it comes to um, making sure that it sticks properly. It isn't an easy thing, I will admit. And it's also not cheap to treat because you will have to take several things. So for example, my protocol looked like this. So every morning I would have the herbal antimicrobials. I would have a specific uh, strain of yeast, which is called SB or Saccharomyces boulardii. I would have the biofilm disruptors and I was also taking digestive enzymes. So that's gonna help break down your food and alleviate discomfort. And I would take it strategic, st strategically in the morning and at night and some things throughout the middle of the day as well. And then on top of that, you've got to be super on your A game when it comes to diet. So like I said, you know, you just, you cannot afford really to have little cheat meals here and there when it comes to a SIBO protocol because you will just keep stoking the fire. Because what happens is those bacteria, they are just hanging out for those sugars. And even if you say you're, you've gone off those foods for a week and those bacterial numbers have declined significantly, there'll still be some really stubborn buggers there that are just waiting for that little bit of a slip up to come in. And then you do it and all of a sudden they'll thrive. And if any of you guys know how you know, Darwin's theory works when it comes to evolution and survival of the fittest and all that kind of stuff.
basically the strongest ones are the ones that will flourish and then they'll evolve. So, and that's how antibiotic resistance works because antibiotics will come in, they'll kill off those, um, most of the bacteria, but there'll be a few really strong ones that are still existing. Um, and then if they're left to exist and you didn't quite finish the protocol properly, well, guess what happens? All of a sudden you've got a bigger beast on your hands because now you've got even more resistant bacteria that also thrive. Um, flourish therefore you need even stronger stuff to come in if you go down that path in the end you may need to do something like the elemental diet because you've just got to completely starve them of their fuel source so when you finish the SIBO protocol you have to also heal your gut so there's always going to be leaky gut with SIBO like it's kind of impossible for there not to be um, and I'll explain leaky gut also in another video. Let me know if, if you would like to know a bit more about leaky gut in the comments below. And you need to heal that. You need to make sure that you're now feeding your good bacteria to help them grow again and flourish so that it doesn't allow the bad bacteria to regrow again. So it's really important to get those levels up. Of course, there's other factors at play as well. Like, do, you know, do you have a, a parasite? Some people have parasites and don't realize. And of course, with the antimicrobial herbs, you may be targeting the parasites anyway and get a, a nice benefit out of getting rid of the parasite at the same time. There are other little extra tips and tricks that you can do to enhance your, your SIBO protocol. So I know for constipation, it's really, so methane dominant, it's really important to make sure that you are getting that faster transit time. We do like to use what we call prokinetics. So they're um, basically herbs or other food stuff that will allow you to have a faster transit time. And then if not that, some people, I haven't done this myself and I'm not telling you to go and do it. Please just do your research beforehand because I hear pros and cons of this. Some people do the coffee enemas to help to just really clean out the bowels and empty out that, that extra content that's kind of stuck in there. I do, however, I have recommended to patients before to do the colonics and I've heard really good results of that. I have never done it myself either. I felt like I've been able to overcome it by doing other things, but I know with my patients, they would always want faster results. They didn't want to be doing a million different things. Whereas as a naturopath, we don't care, you know, we'll just do what we need to do. But I do I do want to get my clients' results as quickly as possible. I don't want to um, prolong their suffering. So anything I can do to help support that but still make it sustainable, I'll do it. And if they're willing to spend the money as well, because, you know, once you add in the colonics and the, the foods and the supplements and, and the consults with myself, of course, like it is expensive, I'm not gonna lie. However, the quality of life that people end up adding for long term once you help conditions like this is priceless. And ultimately, you may end up spending less money in the long run for the upfront investment because you're no longer just, you know, stoking this fire forever and ever by and then just adding in all these supplements because you read online that this does this and you, you're going to try that this time, you're going to try this this time and you end up just wasting your money because you're not actually being more specific. So that would be my long-winded way of saying, you know, it's you've got to invest in your health now so that you actually save money and obviously save your health and your happiness long term. So that's basically SIBO and my battle with SIBO as well as how do you get rid of it? What are the things that you need to do to really make that plan stick? Ultimately, SIBO is really not something that you can just self-diagnose and self-prescribe. Like you really need to have the test and work with a practitioner who's experienced with working with SIBO because otherwise you are definitely going to waste your money and you're going to flush it down the drain. And I can even vouch for that as well. So if you do want to know more um, or you, you do, you would like to work with me with SIBO, you're welcome to um, head to my website and you can book through the link there. I run online consults. All my um, clinic is basically virtual, which is awesome because you don't need to even leave your, the comfort of your own home. Um, you don't need to get stuck in traffic or you can, you can choose times that are flexible to you. 
Sorry, Millie's crying in the background, looking for a ball, I think. And so basically the first consult is one hour and we run through everything. It's really in depth. I will talk to you about what tests you need to get and I'll refer if you need to. Then I'll prescribe using an online system where I will prescribe your prescription and then you go online, you pay for it and it gets sent to your door straight away. So it's, it's a really, really good service. It makes life so much easier in today's day and age. Virtual consults is incredible. It's, it's just something that really is revolutionizing the way that we can get healthy. So I'm really happy that I've been able to provide a service that can do that. Um, so you can book online. My link is also available in my Instagram link tree as well. It's really easy to do that. So anyway, I hope this was useful and maybe even if you don't have SIBO, maybe it's made you think, shit, that sounds like me. I think I might need to get SIBO tested and it's really easy to get tested these days it just takes a little bit of perseverance when doing the test <laughs> anyway um please comment below if you liked this or there's anything that you want to find out more about subscribe i really really want to try and build this channel for you guys and by subscribing that really helps me it motivates me and keeps me committed to doing it and of course share with anyone that you think would enjoy this as well bye bye